some code here. Okay, so let's start. <laughs> so, welcome everybody, and uh, welcome to this Ipancos seminar. And today we have we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Ruben Pedriani. Um, Ruben is graduating in mathematics from the University of Cali. He, he, was, he did his final year here at mm -hmm. the UCM. And he also did his master in astrophysics here at home. <laughs> and he moved to Ireland when he did a PhD in astrophysics at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And after the PhD, he moved to Sweden, yeah, where he was awarded at Marie Curie Individual uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship in group with the professor Jonathan Tan. Mm -hmm. And today we are very happy. To, to be with you here, yeah. and he's going to talk about the uh, uh, massive star formation uh, with infrared observation. Thank you very much, Ruben. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Africa, for, for the nice introduction and, and also for, for the invitation. So, I guess you guys can hear me all right, the, the people yeah. here. So, uh, can I have some sub for people on Zoom if they can hear me all right? I am. I'm trying something new, so I'm presenting with the iPad because I think it's the best way to hybrid, but I want to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. So if somebody can thumbs up over there. Okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys. Right, so without any further ado, let me, let me start. Uh, and today, well, uh, as I said, thank you very much for having me here. I'm super excited, I'm back home, and I'm really happy to, to see many uh, familiar faces. So, yeah, so these are, I'm going to talk today about massive star formation uh, from an observational point of view. Uh, at least you will see some pretty pictures, I hope. And I would like also to, to thank all, you know, the, the collaborators here that without them, uh, this, this work could not be presented. And I would also like to thank uh, the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship that is funding this, uh, this research. Okay, so I think it's a, it's a nice way to start to show one of my favorite images here, that is a massive star forming region where you can see, you can see that uh, all this gas and dust that is forming a massive star. I'm gonna get more into the detail how this, uh, this formation is happening. But before that, let me tell you a little bit the outline of the talk. I'm gonna try to talk for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, please, if you do have any questions, Raise your hand, or maybe we can leave it until the end, whatever you like, uh, guys want. Okay, so I'm gonna do an introduction to star formation, but in particular also in massive star formation. Um, I'm gonna talk about the SOMA survey, that is the SOFIA Massive Star Formation Survey, and in particular the near infrared, which is my, my main domain, okay? I'm gonna introduce SCD Creator, this is a new Python package that I have developed. And I think it may be useful for everybody in the community. I hope so. I have worked a lot on that. And um, I'm also going to show you uh, JETS, which is the main topic of my research in, uh, in the star formation. JETS, as I also want to tell you how they are formed, how we observe them. And finally, I'm going to show you some uh, recent results of one specific high mass star forming region. OK, but first of all, uh, why is it important to study star formation or massive star formation, okay? Uh, massive star regulate uh, the process of star formation from the early stage when they form and they blast powerful outflows and jets, but they also, when they die, you know, if they are more than eight star masses, they blast at a supernovae and they uh, uh, add instability to the cloud, can trigger more star formation and add heavy elements to, to the cloud back, no? Uh, however, they are really challenging to study both theoretically and observationally because they, some of the observational challenges is that they are located at great distances on the order of kiloparsecs and they do have high extensions and they do live short. I, I like to say actually that massive stars are the rock stars of the universe because they live fast, right? Uh, so it's difficult to catch them. Uh, right, so let me also walk you through the cycle of a stellar birth and death. Um, so, you know, we have a diffuse cloud here that for some, uh, I'm not going to get into detail here, but it collapses, okay, it's through some process that is gravitational collapse, and we've got this uh, dense cloud, all right? Within this dense cloud, we have different cores. So if we zoom in in one of these cores, we get into this star and planet formation phase 
where we can see uh, disks, uh, jets, and you know these powerful outflows. I'm going to get into more detail in the next slide about how the different classes of formation happens. Okay, but this is our general picture that when this star is formed, it goes into the phase of protoplanetary disk when we have our young protoplanetary system, and finally we have our young stellar system with a planet such as our own. However, if the mass of the star is greater than eight solar masses, you know that the life will end, you know, as a supernova. And then heavy elements will be created and re-injected back into the cloud and continue this cycle of stellar birth and death. But as promised, a little bit more of detail into the process of star formation uh, is normally divided into these uh, classic panels here with the different classes and, and, and stages or evolutionary stages. This is true for low mass star formation. I'm going to say in a second also about high mass star formation, but basically this is the cloud that I showed you before. And if you see here, I hope you can see it, you have like different cores. So if we zoom in here and we come into the class zero phase, we see that for the conservation of angular momentum, when we have a sphere that is slowly rotating, it will flatten into a, a disk. This is the so-called accretion disk. Also, the natural response from disks are the so-called bipolar outflows here. I'm gonna, again, uh, later in the talk, I will say a few more words about jets and how they are produced. But long story short, this process that can uh, last for 10 million years pass through different phases where different processes can be traced with different wavelengths, right? So um, the younger you are, the longer the wavelength you have to go because this is obscure in gas and dust, right? So this is what the takeaway message for from this slide. Right, so in this case of high mass star formation, which are those with more than eight solar masses, and it's not, a comp it's not that simple because we have the radiation pressure problem, it's not that easy, but there are some models that can explain masses as we see in the sky that are greater than eight solar masses, obviously. There are two leading theories that, uh, that aim to explain how masses form. So we've got one that is core accretion, that is the so is also called isolated formation, and this is sort of a scale-up version of the low mass regime, right? So you have the, the main assumption is that you have one main core represented here as blue that will collapse into one massive star, and you have the classical disks that are disaccreting and the ejection of outflows, right? The other leading theory is the so-called competitive accretion. Uh, a scale here, I should have put like a, a, a scale bar or something are uh, way different. This is on the order of a few thousand a year or something, and this is on the order of a few thousand parsecs here. So this is an entire cloud that is collapsing and forming stars. Actually, if you can see, I hope you can see at least in Zoom, there are little dots here that are the stars form. And these filaments are where stars are formed, basically, okay? So what are the main difference between these two theories that uh, on the right here, on the competitive accretion, these are normally more chaotic processes and on the core accretion is more isolated and call it in a way less chaotic. Okay, so uh, this is under study and one of the ways to tackle it is through observation theory, simulations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the, the PI of one of the surveys that aims to explain massive star formation is Jonathan Tam, and the survey is the so-called SOFIA Massive Star Formation Survey, or for short, SOMA. I'm going to say this word a lot, so bear in mind. And these are the collaborators of this uh, contribution that are coming from many different countries and institutions. So let me tell you a little bit about SOMA and what it aims. So, in the Zhang and Tan series that goes from uh, all the way back to 2003 in the turbulent core accretion model, McKee and Tan 2003, uh, they created uh, this core accretion model and follow up with radiative transfer model, which are this Zhang and Tan series, as uh, you can see here. Basically, the main assumption, as I say, is that you have one main clump that uh, will produce one main core that will produce one main star. So that's the main assumption that can be true, that can be not, but this is the main assumption that we are working on here. Right, 
So uh, the main thing that I'm going to tell you today is the generation of a spectral energy distribution. And when you measure fluxes at different wavelengths, you can create, as I said, this uh, spectral energy distribution that depends upon three main parameters. That is the uh, mass of the density of the clump, the mass of the core, and the mass of the stack. And this is one a specific example here. But then you can also retrieve volumetric luminosity, uh, opening angle of the jet, which is indicated here, and many other interesting things. OK, so uh, the SOMA survey up to now, what has been done is to collect data from SOFIA. For those who don't know, this is a telescope mounted on a 747 Boeing, I think, a big plane, as you can see there, and observes uh, up in the sky, up in the, in the atmosphere. It gets rid of more than 90% of the atmosphere, but it still is not enough. In the infrared, you see that the water vapor is really bad for infrared um, observations. And also in Sophia, uh, well, in Soma, sorry, we are retrieving our cable data from Spitzer and Herschel to complete the peak of the CD at the beginning. And this is one classical uh, image that we used to show is a six panel, uh, figure with the different wavelengths. Um, and also one of the main predictions of, uh, of this core accretion model is that the longer the, wave, the wavelength goes, the more rounded the protostar looks. And the reason for that is that in the short wavelength, when you don't see the far emission in the long wavelength, sorry, let me start that again. When you don't see that short emission that is obscured by gas and dust, you can start seeing that at longer wavelengths, as you can see here. And that prediction, you know, uh, is confirmed by these observations. Right. But as I said, we are very interested in forming these SCDs because we have the models to retrieve mass of the core, uh, mass of the star, mass accretion rate, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to show a table just in a minute. And let me also tell you a little bit of the... Um, uh, the status of, of the SOMA survey. So, so far, we have observed about 50 massive protostars with Sophia forecast, and for most of them, we have also Spitzer and Herschel. There's been a, a number of papers where, you know, in, in SOMA 1, as we call it, which was the first of the series, we present the overview and the first results. In the second, we presented the high luminosity sources, that these are massive sources, especially um, important. In the three, we present the intermediate mass sources because in SOMA, we are not only focusing on high mass stars, but also intermediate stars. What we don't do much is low mass, okay? Because these models are specifically focused on high mass. And now this is, uh, we just submitted it, uh, this paper uh, in the SOMA 4, where we present isolated protostars uh, as looked at in the infrared. Uh, yeah, and there are a number of follow-ups which are very interesting to break the generality that, um, in this case, in the, in the radio by Viviana Rossero and collaborators that are looking at the VLA, right? Good. This is sort of what we have. But uh, also in SOMA4, let me introduce you. I'm proud to introduce you the SED creator. This is a new Python package that is based on these uh, relative transfer models, um, the model grid of this. Uh, Zan and Tam models, okay? And there was, they released an ideal version that is available in that uh, URL if you're interested. But you know what? Ideal is not free, it's not open source, and it's not that friendly, at least not for me, it's not my friend. So I am a, a Python lover, so I decided to take upon this project and create SED Creator. And it's hosted here in GitHub and, and PyPy, so if you're interested, please do check it out. Um, feedback is most, more than welcome. And you can simply install it by pip install SD Creator. If you are used to Python, you'll recognize this thing. What does it do, though? Why, why am I presenting to you? The reason is because it's a, it's, a, it's a tool that has two main functions or two main classes that you can use regardless of your field, regardless of what you're going to do. So I've done like the SED fluxer, as you can see there on my left-hand side, and the SED fitter. So within SED fluxer, 
we have obviously to get the flux or to get even the raw flux. I'm going to get into detail there. And you can retrieve different um, information. You can make plots, you can take the info, you can get the value. And in the CD fitter, obviously, as the name says, you can fit the, the, the flux that you measure. So why do I say that this can be used by anybody? It's because if you are in any field, like extragalactic, galactic, uh, stars or whatever, you may be interested in measuring fluxes. And maybe you have your super good tool, that's fair enough, but sometimes do not. Okay, so in this case, you can use the fluxer to retrieve the flux. And there are two functions here, that is get flux if the image is uh, calibrated, so it reads the header and just gives you the flux in Jansky, happy days, or if you don't have it calibrated because life is hard, uh, you get the get drop flux and you make your own, um, your own transformations. There are examples on the internet and the thing is that with a line of code, you should be able to measure your flux, okay? Again, if you have your super good tool that you measure the fluxes, that is good, but you're interested in, in fitting these fluxes with the fitter using the Zananta models, you can come here and also fit it. So it's a double tool, which I think is going to be useful. Cool. One of the main problems uh, in order to measure fluxes is the definition of the aperture. Uh, sometimes, uh, what is aperture? Is one or second, ten or second, a thousand or seconds? We have created then an uh, algorithm that is get optimal aperture that is within SD Creator, and what it does is the following. I acknowledge that this, uh, this work has been done in collaboration with Zoe Telkan, that is a graduate student in the University of Virginia, and she's been fantastic, she's done an amazing job. And what it does is a, it's a few thousand lines of code that summarizes in one line that basically scans the image, as you can see here, in order to retrieve the maximal flux without getting too much of the background. Let me that, explain that to you. So you see that we increase the aperture here and the flux is increasing here, as you can see. So we want to take most of the flux without, again, getting much of the background. So um, it, it should stop right, right there, okay? And that's it. So, so you, you do that. Uh, you do that for several thousand stars. Uh, and you, the, the, fun, the, the good thing about this is that you obtain an objective aperture. So if I want to tell you, look, I chose 20 seconds, it's because there is an algorithm behind it. Because before, if you check out papers, normally the choice of the aperture is not well justified. And that was something that we wanted to, uh, to, to overcome. Okay, so just give, uh, this is just uh, an example of, um, of one of the sources of SOMA4 that was used using NCD Creator. So all these plots, has been made with a line of code. So uh, hopefully it's a user-friendly code. And, and as you can see here, you have the Spitzer reference here, Sophia and Herschel, okay? And that defines your SCD. That will give you all these parameters. There's a lot of information here, but what it can tell you is that uh, from this SCD, you can, as I said, retrieve the mass of the core that the star is forming, the mass of the star that is important to see uh, the evolution of stages, SAS and charge, um, and different, uh, different parameters such as the, the viewing angle, that is from which angle we are seeing the system, that, that is also important to, you know, to, to make predictions uh, and to observe the system. And finally, also important is the, the volumetric luminosity here that is associated with uh, the mass of the star. So this is, in a nutshell, so on. Uh, with the tool, we revisit all the sources. We have more than 40 sources now, and obviously you cannot do it by hand. So we put like, uh, we made the tool exactly for that because I was in charge of that and he said, nope, I'm not going to do this by hand. So that's why, that's the motivation of the tool. Okay, this is, this doesn't tell you anything. You know? This is a whole bunch of SCD, but what, what do you want to tell me? What I want to tell you, uh, you, what you can do here, let me go back, is, yeah, you can retrieve for, for each single SCD, you can retrieve different physical properties as I showed you in the previous slide. So if we put them all together, we can start to make trends plots, as you can see here. So if we plot the mass of the envelope, that is the big thing that is enclosed in the core, versus the volumetric luminosity, there is a clear correlation here, which is good as expected, but it's good to observe it. Also, this is the distribution, which is a little bit more scattered of 
the three main physical parameters, the mass of the core, the mass surface density here of the clump and the mass of the star. There is a potential uh, um, trend here, correlation that you know says that the higher the mass of the of the core, the higher the mass of the star, which is also expected. And this is one of the most important plots that we show in SOMA4, that is a prediction. Well, this is the comparison between the mass surface density of the clamp versus the mass of the star. Um, you see that here in the upper right corner, there is a clump of sources. And the, and the thing is that it seems potentially that to form a massive star, that means greater than 25 solar masses, you need a high mass surface density. And the lines that I'm showing you here, the green line is a prediction from, Zan, uh, from Tanaka, Tang, and Zan 2017. So it's good. So when you have a massive core of 100 solar masses, you predict those, uh, those masses. So in that sense, it's, it's predicting well. However, this is important. There was a prediction by Krumholz and Maki 2008 that says that, oh no, that says that these uh, uh, stars, massive stars should not exist if the mass of the clamp was below one gram per cc. And as you can see, we have a start here. So, you know, it's also important to check against models and to revisit these simulations and theoretical models, okay? So this is also one of the main contribution of this SOMA. Okay, so the SOMA survey here. So, hmm, there is something is missing. I think you, you can, you can agree with me that there is a, a, a missing thing in the SOMA survey that is the near infrared component. I have been showing you mid infrared and far infrared data, but you know, they look, um, they look as they look. <laughs> so that is what it comes, this uh, Marie Curie action that uh, I, I recently was awarded, where I aim to, uh, to answer two main questions or two main topics, that is the the physical properties of massive protostars yet under driving sources through the near infrared, and again, the near infrared characterization of protostar cluster environment. So let me tell you a little bit more about the protostellar jets that can be used as a tool. As, as, as I've shown you, this uh, high mass YSO, this is what it stands for, high mass young stellar objects, are deeply embedded in gas and dust. Therefore, this artist's impression what we actually see is something like that. So we see obscuration. Therefore, uh, since the natural consequence of accretion disk are jets and outflow, we can retrieve information from the central source, even though we don't see it in the case of near infrared. Um, just to, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about a lot about jets and outflow. So uh, this is a, again, an artist's impression or a schematic view of what you should have in your mind when I talk about jets, outflow, disk, envelopes, so we've got here the central star, the accretion disk that is feeding the star, and then we have the primary jet that is ejected from the star disk system. Um, then we have the, the envelope that is feeding the disk, <laughs> and it's got this uh, low velocity outflow that normally is swept up material, that is dragged material from, from the jet. That was an artist's impression, but this is a real image. I always show it because I love it. This is the system HH212. This is a low mass protostar. And you see here the beautiful uh, outflow that is uh, ejecting here. This is a scale bar just to give you a, a sense of what you're seeing. <clears throat> and as you may have expected, the driving source is right here obscured in the near infrared. I should say that this image was taken at two microns, 2.12 particularly in the filter of molecular hydrogen. Right, this is low mass, but let me show you also high mass. Uh, I know that there are extragalactic people here and this scale probably are <laughs> like a joke for you, but just to give you a sense, again, this is almost seven parts big uh, or large, this, uh, this source. And if I were to put the closest star to Earth in this system, this is where it would be. Okay, so, I mean, these things are big or not as big as the agents and stuff, but anyway. <laughs> um, also, I'm gonna show a few uh, spectrums. I want to make sure that you understand what each, each thing. So 
Again, we have the central star here and, and the Christian disk represented with this uh, drawing and the bipolar outflows, okay? And there are different tracers such as the bracket gamma that is a line a 2.16, that is a, a hydrogen recombination line that is tracing, you know, it's, it can trace many things. It can be the magnetospheric accretion, the stellar wind, or even the outflow. I'm gonna show you a few examples now uh, that can trace different things. Then we have the thing that I focus most on are the molecular hydrogen and the iron forbidden two here that are shock tracers. That is sort of like the, the jet and outflow. And how does it look? So if we place a long slit or an IFU on top of a system, this is how it looks. So we have a rising spectrum and that is motivated by the emission of hot dust that reddens the, the spectrum here. And we have a whole bunch of lines that I showed you before. We've got here the bracket gamma, molecular hydrogen, sodium, et cetera, et cetera. And something very important is also the CO bank heads. That is a tracer, perhaps I can go back, of the uh, accretion disk. Okay, that is a warm CO, about two to 5,000 Kelvin, <clears throat> that is super important to trace the mid plane of the disk. Okay, so now that you are all experts in, uh, in a spectrum in the infrared, <clears throat> let me show you some four high mass joint star systems. So uh, again, from now on, I'm gonna show near infrared images, okay? So in the range of one, two, two microns. This high mass star system where the, the main source is right here in the middle and you have the elongation of a bipolar outflow here. So if we place a long slit along the knot, uh, this is what we see. We see uh, all these, uh, um, different lines, molecular hydrogen that we can retrieve velocity, sorry, yeah, velocities, we can retrieve temperature, we can retrieve column density, which are the common values here, et cetera, et cetera. And also if you have high resolution spectroscopy, you can retrieve uh, kinematical properties such as velocities, mass ejection rate, momentum, et cetera. And these are the classical values that we have found in a number of YSOs, high mass Jones objects. So how does it connect? What is the motivation for someone near infrared, someone near NRI? So again, this six panel figure here, I mean, <laughs> there's not much that you can see here. Now I'm gonna show you what you can see in the near infrared. So you see pretty much sun elongation along the north south axis, probably because of the outflow. But if we look at this in the near infrared, this is what you see. Uh, just to give you a sense, all this thing here, is embedded in this small um, counter here. And what we trace in the infrared, as I said, is the uh, warm material of the outflow that is shining up here um, in reddish colors. I should have put here, I forgot, I guess, uh, it's, it's an RGB image where red is iron, green is H-band continuum, and J is blue continuum. Okay, so, <clears throat> If you have imaging and spectroscopy, you can do this kind of thing, which are the so-called uh, PV diagram, position velocity diagrams, and you can retrieve useful information such as the velocity of the jet at each given position. So in the case of the item, I'm gonna uh, run quickly through here. You see that, um, yeah, by the way, that, that is a, a zoom in of the system with all different wavelengths that all beautifully align all the way from the radio to the near infrared. And we measure velocities in the iron forbidden to of, a, of more than 200, 200 kilometers per second that is associated with shocks, as you can see there. Then in the case of the bracket gamma that it told you can trace jets, disks, or such, you, you have to do this kind of um, study because you don't know where it comes from. In the case of this source, you see that this extends more than 18, thousand AU, that cannot come from the disk. The disk is smaller than that. And you see that is elongated along the jet axis and can, uh, and can have more than 500 kilometers per second, right? And then we have another component that is peaking at zero that it may come from radiation from the central source. Okay, that, that's, that was seen for the first time. And uh, as the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been seen again in a, in a source like so extended bracket gamma. Okay, so uh, 
again, how, how do we connect to the SOMA survey? So just to recap, uh, the SOMA survey has observed with Sophia more than 50 high mass terraforming regions. And with the SOMA near, near infrared, we have to observe, we have to start a campaign with HSD, LBT, and VLT to observe all of them if we can. But so far we have 20. We have used, as I said, HSD, LBT, and VLT, as, uh, as I said there. Let me tell you um, more details about the LVT, which may be the one that you are less familiar with, because I know that you guys use a lot VLT. So I'm leading a campaign here in the VLT, sorry, in the LVT Large Binocular Telescope that are twin telescope of eight meters shooting at the same place on the sky. And that's super cool because you can put pairs of filters observing at the same time with all the benefits of that, right? That you, you have the same scene, you have the same systematics and so on. In particular, I have used Lucy 1 and Lucy 2. Those are imaging along lit spectroscopy. But today I'm gonna, tell, I'm gonna talk to you about imaging. And just to give you a sense, the typical observation set is as described there. It takes less than an hour and we take a whole bunch of filters in the continuum to trace the circumstellar environment of the region and also narrowband filters to trace um, jets and shock material activity. Okay, let me show you some pretty pictures here. So this is the, the, the image that I showed you at the very beginning. This is AFGL 5180. This is a region where massive stars are forming and you see all this gas and dust as traced by these filters here with the HST. When we observe with the LVT uh, in this band here, you see that a different picture arises. I hope you can see. But in reddish colors are all these beautiful molecular hydrogen uh, jets that are, as I said, activity of formation of stars. If I zoom in a little bit more, you see that uh, in the K band, that is the, what I'm showing you here, is peering deeper through the cloud rather than the HST that stops at 1.6. So it's a little bit more uh, limited in order to, um, to see in, in massive star formation. Nonetheless, super important. Uh, a little bit more on this region is that we were lucky to get AO observation with the new system SOUL, that is adaptive optics observations. Um, and that was the region that what you see. And let me put you the two observation next to the other. I hope in the Zoom you can see better because here in life is not that great. But basically, I can tell you verbally that uh, we were actually really lucky that in C limited mode, we go above one second, it was 0 0.8, which was already great. And you see here, that is good. But when we go to AU, we get like a factor of eight better. So we went to down to 0 0.1. And this is what you see, you see like, all the green details in order to uh, study the surrounding of the massive protostar. And just to give you a sense, the HST diffraction limited is about 0 0.16 at seconds. Okay, so, but, but what is the beauty of this near infrared SOMA is to combine them both. So for another object that is a IRAS uh, 07299, this is what we know from Sophia. So we have, a, you know, we have a, a blob there, which is important because you can get deeper into the, uh, into the gas and dust because of the longer wavelength. But again, when we see in the near infrared, this is what you see. Um, again, dust maybe could tell you nothing, but if I put you in perspective, if I put the contours on top of the region, this is how it looks. And, uh, and if I also put the seven micron, this is what you have. So Sophia is great to locate the central region of the, of the meeting protostar that is most likely there with the seven micron peaks here. Uh, this is HST again. And when I show um, a closing of the HST, this is just H band and J band. This is what you see. So it's really obscure and you don't see much, but when we add the K band from LBT, you know, the light uh, appears. And this is what you see uh, in, in this particular region. But what is this? What, what am I showing you? This source was published in, uh, back in 2018 in Nature Astronomy by Zhang and collaborators with ALMA. So we can put it on top and see how everything beautifully aligns 
in this system. So we have the dust emission from ALMA at band six, as you can see there, and the reflected light most likely from this protostars forming. Because in fact, this is a binary system, one of the first massive binary systems to be seen, if not the first. Okay, so you'll see here, I'm showing you how all near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared, and ALMA can trace very beautifully the system of a massive star forming. Good, but not only that. So we are also making uh, more results and, and software where we are interested in the opening angle of the jet. I think this is also relevant for other um, for other systems. It could be from also IGN you, when you look at the at the jets of, of these massive galaxies and stuff. What we're interested in here is to, to constrain the, open, the, yeah, the opening angle. That is what I'm showing you here on the left, on, the, on my right, sorry, is how much wide it is. And why is that important? It's because evolutionary sequence are directly related to the opening angle of the sources. Normally, the more massive and the more evolved, the, the wider it is, and the less massive and less evolved, the narrower it is. Again, this thing has been done in a visual manner, not in an objective manner, as far as I know, at least for, uh, for massive star formation. So we have developed an algorithm um, together with Ethan Duncan, that is a, a summer student working with us uh, from the University of Arizona. And, and basically what these things does is to scan the image here and using a grading algorithm, sort of like outlines what you would do by eye, okay, but objectively and define the opening angle here. And this is the final result that you would have. So you, you have a main opening angle with some dispersion, obviously, you know, because you have this dispersion here. And why, again, why this is important, why you should care about this? Uh, is because, as I said, we retrieve an opening angle here. And when we do the SCD, everything is sort of like uh, encapsulated into the SOMA uh, science here. You have the degeneracy the in, the, in the models as NS, any SCD. So actually, you can ask me, what, is, what are the caveats of SCD, the degeneracy? You see here that, uh, for example, here, the best five models tells you that the mass of the source is anywhere from 32 to 16. Okay, while this is not great, it's better than nothing. <laughs> uh, but if we have more uh, constraints, we can further constrain our models, right? So if we have imaging to tell us, okay, I know that this SCD is the best, but I also have information from, for example, the opening angle. So you can rule out a number of models, okay? Cool, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through this uh, final result that we recently published in, with, the, with, with another summer student. Uh, this is a uh, integral field unit observations in protostellar jets, everything related again with, uh, with these massive stars, SOMA and all this. Uh, this is a system that is located at three kiloparsecs with the luminosity and with this cloud. And this is what we knew before. See, we just knew that there was a bipolar outflow that you normally can't think that is one source shooting one outflow. That is the main hypothesis that we have here. And there was also uh, this CO outflow two to one from the radio, from Boiter et al. That it looks like that, okay? Right, so as I said, uh, work by Ana, Ana Costa Silva. She's now a grad student in Porto. And she's doing exoplanet. So those doing exoplanet, keep an eye on her. She's fantastic. Um, and what we did was to observe uh, with the VLT Symphony and Camos. These are uh, integral field unit observation. That is that you have images and a spectra. And that is super cool because you can do many things. I'm gonna show you. First of all, you can do uh, the classic imaging thing that you show how it looks, for example, in the, in the molecular hydrogen. Uh, I'm gonna show many, many figures now that have, you have to pay attention to the lower left corner. That one is for Camos and the other is for Symphony. Camos is larger, Symphony is smaller, okay? So we combine them both because Symphony have a better signal to noise um, resolution. Nonetheless, you see here again, a beautiful bipolar outflow. Here you see obscuration because in the near infrared, 
this has so much gas and dust that you cannot see, but I'm going to reveal it in a second how it looks in other wavelengths. Uh, just to, to make a comparison, this thing corresponds to, to those things on the right. And uh, some of the outflow has been identified before in the literature, but again, we didn't know to whom they belong or if they were one, two, three, or five. Uh, we, do, we did a number of continuum um, and bracket gamma uh, emission uh, maps in order to retrieve if there was any YSO activity, as you may imagine there is, but we need to confirm it. And this is how it looks. So we located here seven point sources plus a, a couple of more here in, in KMOS. Uh, these are bracket gamma emitters. And as I told you, this, this is related to YSO activity, either for disks, for jets, for anything, okay? Okay, and, and as I said, you have imaging and spectra, and you can do all this kind of uh, identification of the line. You have the whole molecular hydrogen coming from the jet, but also this bracket gamma, as I just showed you, uh, shown in certain uh, um, sources. Again, since it's an IFU, you can have, uh, you have both imaging and spectra, and you can do this kind of excitation maps, which, which is the ratio between two molecular hydrogen lines, in particular, the 2.12 and 2.25. Um, models tells us that um, if the ratio are greater than 10, these are shocked emission. And this is important because we don't know if it's shocked coming from the jet or if UV pumped by the central source. But these ratios are consistent, as you see all the way, by shocked material. And that is important to, to see what the, the nature of this molecular hydrogen is. Right. Also, since we have a spectra for every single pixel, we can do this kind of velocity maps. And now things are getting interesting because this is not what you expect. You see here that the central region, the stars are over here, probably a cluster, and you see that both sides are Blue shifted. So what happens here? What you expect is to have, I don't know if you can see me there, but you, you have like a jet, one side, the blue shifted side is approaching towards you, and the red shifted side is receding away from you. No, I mean, uh, yeah, moving away from you. But this is not what it's telling us. So something is not in place here. So what it is? Uh, this is just to see what is the main emission. So we have enough signal to noise to, to, to make these claims. But when we plot SMA contours, that means longer wavelength, 12 CO, the picture is different. So you see there that the blue shifted outflow coincides perfectly, but the red shifted uh, is, an, I mean, the red shifted doesn't appear in the near infrared, but it does appear in the 12 CO. Why? Our hypothesis is that the near infrared gets blocked by the gas and dust in the cloud and forming, but the radio can escape, right? So we formed the hypothesis that before it was thought that it was just one main outflow shot by one main star. But we say, nope, that cannot be because at least has to be two outflows. One is coming northwest, southeast. You see here, uh, outflow number one. And another outflow number two is coming on this way. Uh, I don't know if you can see super well, but you have, uh, again, SMA contours here on the right, uh, on the right downside and blue contours that coincide with the near infrared uh, on the upper left corner. So it seems reasonable that there are more than one outflow as previously thought. Right, so let me put everything together for this region and combine near infrared, ALMA, 2.7 millimeters that perfectly aligns with what is obscured in infrared. Um, also the peaks of ALMA, there are six peaks, probably six forming stars, uh, some radio data there, more VLA data, six centimeter that is tracing jet activity, but also radio jet activity, and uh, other VLA 1.3 centimeters. The reason that they probably do not align perfectly is because of astrometric errors. Okay, uh, we need to give some uh, some few tens of seconds here for uh, astrometry, um, and yeah, and also we have the meeting for a peak. So what is the hypothesis of what we conclude on this? Is that there are two main driving sources that are uh, traced by the VLA, centimeter, ALMA, but not the near infrared here. So we claim that this is the most massive driving the, this jet here. And there is another one that 
and again has a VLA six centimeter and a meeting for a peak that is probably tracing the other outflow. And this seems reasonable to us. And the good thing is that we've reported for the first time these sources in the infrared, and it's consistent of being a YSO because it's got this rising continuum, as I told you before. So everything seems to fall in place. And just to finish, because I, I see that I'm running a little bit over time, is that we also measure the number density. And why is that important? It's because at the beginning I told you that we also aim to differentiate between core accretion and um, uh, competitive accretion models. Even though that's super difficult and, and observationally, there are uh, some complications, we can estimate the stellar number density. And considering all the sources here, near infrared, bracket gamma emitters, and uh, ALMA peaks and VLA sources, we estimate it to be about 4,000 parsec per, uh, per parsec cube. To put this in context, in the Orion Nebula cluster, it's about 10 to the 4, right? Which is sort of like a factor of 10 more. But predictions or models say, such as those from Bonnell uh, and collaborator 1998, for a stellar collision to happen, which is even more extreme, is an extreme case of competitive accretion, you need 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 parsecs. This is a sort of um, a prediction. And we see that for this particular object, that's not happening. So maybe for this, uh, for this source, stellar collisions or competitive aggression models cannot occur. Again, we, we, we fitted this uh, SED, okay, that I told you before with the SED creator and so on. So we measure fluxes all over the place and this is what we have. Um, yeah, so the main result, you, you've seen this kind of plot already, so you know, I'm not gonna stop here, but basically what, what we could retrieve is that the best five model tells us that uh, the mass of the central source is about four to eight solar masses, consisting of being, again, a massive protostar or in the process of being a massive protostar. Something that I didn't mention before is that we also predict the mass accretion rate. That is how many solar masses per year does the star accrete. And that is about 10 to the minus four. And if a star is forming for about 100,000 years, you will end up with enough mass to be a massive star, more than eight solar masses. <clears throat> okay, so just to finish, I would like to verbalize to my conclusion rather to write them down. This is another thing that I'm trying out is that uh, we have observed with Sophia more than 50 sources in order to confirm or refuse the core accretion model. This is based in core accretion. We have made a follow up with um, VLT here uh, and also with LBT in order to retrieve further information of the massive protostars and to try to break the generancy. And finally, also with the HST. And, and everything together with follow up in the radio and ALMA, I think can bring us a really good de detailed view of how massive stars are formed. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any, any questions. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> That's been very, very nice. And now it's time for questions. I don't know if Kia in the audience is in the Maritza, uh, can you say something about the higher left? Maybe you can. Yeah, I, 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 I'll verbalize the question again. So, what do you say? Maritza. Maritza asks if I can say anything about the IMF. Uh, the short answer is no, because I don't do that. <laughs> but my group, I mean, the group that I'm working on, there is, uh, there is a lot of work in IMF actually. So we work with also infrared cloud and also stellar content with HST, uh, VLT and so on. So we actually measure fluxes and massive stars. And we're working now on a project that we think we see the turnover of the IMF. So I'm not working directly on that, but actually some of the outcomes of this near infrared imaging is to literally uh, um, measure the IMF. The thing is that I have started with my jets, which is the thing that I'm more comfortable with, but I have already started making some plots and I mean, some scripts to extract the sources and to, put, uh, and to place them into the IMF. But I don't think I can tell you more details of that. I can tell you though, <laughs> I forgot to put it there, is that we have been awarded a GWST cycle one proposal, yay, to study the IMF <laughs> in G286, which is, we claim is one of the, the smallest metallicity regions in the in the in our own galaxy. 
So stay tuned. We have a word that I think for April. So after April, we should be super quick to publish the results. So. And can you say something about the physical environment, the metabolism, for example, if it's very low metabolism environment, it's very low information with its massive stars or magnetic fields, for instance. Maritza is following up question is that if, we, if I can say anything about the metallicity of the regions or uh, the magnetic fields and stuff. Again, the short answer is no, because I don't do those things, but uh, I, I'm here from my team, so I'm a team player. And I can also tell you that in the case of uh, magnetic fields, we have also been awarded recently, actually we have the data already from Sophia Hawk Plus. I don't know if you're familiar to it, but this is uh, again a Sophia um, instrument that measures magnetic fields. And we see really interesting things that should be published soon. We're gonna make a later on, a letter of it. And, and we trace the magnetic field close to massive protostar that we claim is isolated. And it, it's got some interesting patterns. About the metallicity, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest, because I do not, I do not work on that. But I can, I can, I can ask my comments. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, all questions that have been? Yeah, about this uh, SP, uh, you uh, is uh, <coughs> maybe uh, nice for the near infrared and for the targets or is valid for in general? Right. So uh, David Montes is asking me if the SCD that I'm using, the, the models, I believe, are valid for other sources. Um, do you mean, for example, like low mass sources or galactic sources or whatever? Or? Yeah, the most stuff or something. Okay, the, the answer to that is the models and the SED, therefore, are created for massive stars, intermediate to massive stars. Uh, in the model grid, we have masses from all the way from 0 0.5 to 128. So you can predict those masses. However, uh, the physics that are in it are self consistent to form massive stars. So, in that sense, it's specifically used for massive stars. And in this sense, for example, it's not the, the other, other tools like POSA, for example, mm -hmm. it's not uh, useful for your targets. Exactly. So, David Montes is also following up question is that if POSA, that is the Virtual Observatory Spectral Analyzer, something like that, is a Spanish tool that allows you to fit, um, to fit uh, also SEDs? No is not useful because the physics that are in those models are not applicable to high mass stars. So that's why we need to create our own models. Yeah. Because if you sort of like extend the physics for low mass stars to high mass, it breaks at some point. So that's why we need our own models. Yeah. And in your plots appear uh, like a absorption Yeah, that is the silicate absorption. Uh, 10 microns, uh, and, and that is also predicted by our, our models. In fact, we are also doing a follow-up uh, observation with FIF3LS, I think. I don't know, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, we, we are targeting exactly that uh, silicate feature because it can tell you more about the specific uh, physics of that region. But this is predicted by the models, this uh, association. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, part, it's part of the, the model, yeah. But I think it's also really uh, into the, how you, your extinction law is, because we assume one extinction law that is got that deep. So it's a combination of the two. Okay. Uh, sorry, yeah, um, David Monte was asking also if the silicate uh, absorption was predicted by the models. And I said there is a combination between the models and the extinction law that you choose. I don't know if the, in the audience uh, online, online powers can hear me. We have no questions uh, on Zoom for the moment. Uh, Ruben, I have uh, <coughs> one just uh, question related sure. to the two outputs that you detected mm -hmm. in this nice source. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to, uh, I don't know, uh, are there any other sources with this or already observed? I mean, other sources observed with this? With multiple outputs? Yes. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, many, many. There is a, there is a pay, recent paper by Noni et al. 2019, I think, is okay. by, with Alma and UCMS. I mean, you see all the out, but you see perfectly beautifully all the outflows, blue and red, but all over the place. And, and the mechanics just beside, I mean, below these uh, this multiple outflows, I mean, how, 
can do just putting it in the We normally associate one outflow to one source. Yes. So if we have multiple many sources, sources, we have many outflows. And the thing is that you, we also have to understand that it's a projection, right? Yeah. So you can be a star with your outflow, she can be another star with her outflow. And what I see projected yeah, on, the, on the wall is everything back together. So that's why it's also very important to see the distances to the sources, which in the case of the high mass start is a problem because guy in that case cannot help us that much because they're really obscure and it's in yeah. the visible, right? Yeah, really. So <clears throat> what we can do though is to sort of like um, get rid of foreground stars that are sort of like before the cloud and we say, okay, this is star and not belonging to us. So we can get rid of those. But I have a hard time myself to, to find distances and um, associations and so on. Okay. Yeah. But the mechanism, I think, is similar in yeah, the sense that yes, yes. what well, we need to understand, and actually last week I, I attended also a talk of accretion disk, and pretty much from brown dwarfs to AGNs or even black, black holes, yeah. it's a similar process. Yeah. Jets are accretion power. That is what it is. Uh, now I think it's safe to say it. It's associated also with magnetic fields and so on. So it's, it's very nice to see how these are the all the way from one dwarf to massive black holes, more or less. With some caveats, obviously. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank again to Thank you. I, I don't know, Santi, if you want to say. No, yes. just. Just uh, thank you to, to Robin for the very nice talk and also that the talk has been recorded in YouTube and if you don't mind it will be uploaded and for the people that arrived uh, in the last part of the talk they can recover it and, and, and watch it. Yeah, by all means do, do submit it. Just one question though, could you hear me okay and see the presentation okay? Completely. This being yeah. an experiment for me and I want to see if I should do it again or never again. You should, you should. It, it was very good. Okay, <laughs> good. <Yeah. laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.